Thank you guys for tuning in today and welcome to another episode of The Source. I'm your host, Zain Raza. And today we'll be talking to independent journalist, economist and author, Sheer Hever. Sheer is also the military embargo coordinator of the Boycott National Committee of the BDS movement. Sheer, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much for having me, Zain. You're welcome. Uh, there's an uprising going on in the West Bank. Uh, the German media is not providing a detailed analysis on why it's happening. Can you just start off with what is happening in the West Bank currently? The uprising is very widespread and it is a bit surprising that it's happening in the West Bank specifically because uh, a lot of attention has been given to Gaza and uh, the Palestinians living inside Israel. Uh, and what's happening now in the West Bank is mostly focused on the city of Jenin, but it quickly spread to Nablus and to the Shafat refugee camp in East Jerusalem. So these are very uh, highly populated areas, and all three of these cities actually are also refugee camps. So that's uh, also a very important thing to remember. Since uh, March, the Israeli military has... Uh, launched a very strong repression campaign trying to stop the Palestinian resistance, to crush it with extreme violence. Uh, there were more Palestinians killed this year, even though the year is not over yet, than in the last eight years. Uh, right now we're talking about 130 people who were killed in the West Bank by Israeli forces, many of them children, uh, and um, this is still going on. And can you talk about the causes? What is driving uh, so much discontent in the West Bank? Well, I think a lot of it is the fact that uh, Janine is serving as a symbol of resistance for Palestinians, and it gives them some hope. They are very much uh, upset with the way that the Palestinian Authority has managed things uh, without, uh, with Israel, uh, especially when Palestinian prisoners have escaped from the Gilboa prison uh, and uh, uh, they were from Jenin, and they escaped to Jenin, and then the Palestinian Authority tried to help the Israeli forces to recapture them. Eventually, they were recaptured, but all trust and uh, support for the Palestinian Authority has collapsed. Jenin has become sort of an autonomous part of the West Bank, and with the Palestinian Authority simply afraid uh, and, and unwilling to do anything to uh, take control of the city, the Israeli forces marched in with very brutal uh, uh, violence. The Palestinians are not giving up. And that's why the protest is spreading. Uh, and because Palestinians, of course, don't want to live under Israeli occupation, they don't want to live in a situation of apartheid. Uh, they want to have their freedom and they are uh, going to, to get it. And of course, there are many different ways of getting it. Uh, and there is a debate within um, among Palestinians whether the best way to do this is by non-violent, by peaceful means, such as through the boycott movement against Israel, uh, while other forces are um, calling for armed struggle. And uh, a new group has emerged now in the West Bank. Uh, it's called the Lion's Den, uh, Arin al-Usul. And this group is not affiliated with any of the political parties. Uh, it started in Nablus, but it's spreading as well to other parts of the West Bank. Uh, the Israeli military assassinated the head of this group, and by doing so, they made the group even stronger, as often happens. And this group, on the one hand, is certainly armed and are using armed uh, struggle against the Israeli occupation forces, but at the same time, they're calling for a strike. They're calling also for civil disobedience of Palestinians against occupation. So this is a form of nonviolent resistance. So it remains to be seen which of the two sides will be more powerful. Would you compare this to the intifada that has happened in the past? Is that risen to that level that we, one can characterize it at that? Or uh, do you think there's still some ways to go until we can define it as such? Well, it's not so easy to say what is exactly the border by, at which point you call it an intifada. Intifada is a word in Arabic which means shaking off, shaking off the occupation. This is the whole point. And the first intifada, which uh, started in 1987, and the second intifada, which started in the, uh, October 2000, were not the same kind of resistance. They were not the, uh, based on the same political ideology and the same means of trying to achieve freedom. But what both of them have in common is that they failed, sadly, that the Israeli occupation continued and the apartheid system continues, uh, and that also they represent a certain generation's coming-of-age ceremony of trying to prove that they did their best 
to, to achieve freedom. The first Intifada started 20 years after Israel conquered the Palestinian territory of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. So you had a young generation of people who were born under occupation, who were critical of their own parents. How could you let this happen? How could you bring us up in, a, in this condition of, of occupation? And they want to try to, be, to break free. And the Israeli military crushed that occupation, that, that uh, um, uprising with brutality. 20 years later, there was another generation of young Palestinians. And that's uh, what we saw with the second intifada. Uh, which also said our parents failed to liberate us from occupation, but we were, are going to try our best and we're going to uh, succeed where they have failed. And unfortunately, once again, the Israeli military used uh, even more force, by the way. The Second Intifada was, was crushed with a lot more Palestinian deaths, a lot more Palestinian permanent injuries and a tremendous harm to the Palestinian economy, uprooting of 300,000 olive trees. So that was the second intifada. And now we are 20 years later again. So now we're talking about another generation. This is the third generation of Palestinians who were born under military occupation, who have never tasted freedom, and nevertheless are not content to live under these conditions. Can you talk about the response by the Israeli political establishment as well as the military? How has it gone about the situation? This, I think, is very interesting because uh, while the Palestinians have a lot of experience in fighting against the Israeli occupation, the Israelis seem to have no memory at all of what happened last year. And, and this is a very interesting colonial phenomenon where you have a colonial power uh, which, which again and again is surprised by the Palestinian uprising. There was just a, a, one of the most senior Israeli journalists, Nahum Barnea, just recently published this report and said, I just don't understand it. We have the best intelligence in the world. We have such a powerful army. How can we not put an end to the Palestinian uh, uprising. And, and this is a kind of blindness where he's simply unable to understand why the Palestinians want to be free. For him, uh, Palestinians are not subjects, are not human beings. So, so it's only a matter of technical um, arrangements trying to, to put, take them under control as if, as if they were animals in a cage. And of course, they are not. And we're now very close to the Israeli elections. Ahead of the elections, all of the different parties, whether they call themselves left or right or center, it doesn't matter. They're all supporting the occupation. They're all supporting the apartheid. These are all, all the Zionist parties. And these are the parties that uh, are uh, very much afraid that any kind of actual meaningful policy to try to negotiate with Palestinians, to offer some concessions, to uh, calm down some of the, of the anger and the justified anger among Palestinians, will be perceived as lack of patriotism, as weakness in the face of the Palestinian uprising. So everyone is, is uh, supporting a hardline approach. The hardline approach has failed before, and it continues to fail again. And it came to the point where the Israeli military itself is now out of control. And that's something that's very important to understand. The Israeli soldiers are under the impression that they can do whatever they want. And the, the current uh, commander of commander in chief of the Israeli military, Aviv Kochavi, when he uh, assumed power, he said, we are going to be a more deadly army. Be and that was an act of pandering to the soldiers, telling the soldiers, you can shoot whoever you want and nobody will be held accountable. And as you remember, in May, Israeli uh, sharp uh, shooters assassinated Shirin Abu Akhle, a famous, well-known Palestinian journalist uh, who was reporting for Al Jazeera in Jenin, by the way, the city we were talking about. And the Israeli government uh, is under a lot of pressure to investigate this because this was an unlawful killing. It was clearly a war crime. But the Israeli government refuses to reveal the name of the soldier and refuses to open an investigation simply because they know that the military is out of control. And if they start holding soldiers accountable, there will be an uprising within the Israeli military. So in order to keep the peace within the Israeli military, they now allow the Israeli military to become a sort of, uh, of militia, uh, sort of a group of, of deaf gangs going around in the West Bank and, and shooting at will. They're killing children, they're killing uh, defenseless people, and no one is held accountable, no ch uh, investigations are opened. The spiral of violence, uh, it seems, continues to escalate. And I'm not just talking about uh, this current event, but if we take into account of the whole context of this conflict, uh, it seems that the same script plays over and over again. 
What are the conditions, in your opinion, that are not reported about as much as it should be in the Western media, the underlying conditions that you think are driving this, and what solutions uh, should be pursued to quell discontent and violence and escalation of uh, the situation going forward? Well, I think what we're seeing in terms of the conditions, a deteriorating colonial power, an apartheid state, which has now in a generation of, of Israelis who are no longer willing to pay the price for what it means to create this apartheid system and maintain the apartheid system. So they want to have everything handed out to them. They want to be the lords of the land, but uh, they're not really willing to put their lives at risk and they're not really willing to, to pay an economic price for this. And because of this, they're in a state of collapse. The Israeli government depends on the Palestinian Authority to do its dirty job for it. And the Palestinian Authority, maybe there are some forces within the Palestinian Authority who are willing to do this dirty job for the Israelis, but um, that doesn't mean that they can do it. And the common soldier or the common police officer uh, in, the Palest in the cities of Jenin, in Nablus, uh, and elsewhere, they just don't want to be part of the occupation. I I'm talking about the Palestinian soldiers and Palestinian police officers. They, they don't want to be part of the occupation. They are very unhappy with the orders that they're getting, and the Palestinian government is realizing that they have to change the orders, or maybe just dismantle the Palestinian Authority. But if we're talking about solutions, let's talk about the uh, Intifada of Unity of last year of May, where for the first time, Palestinians from all over, which means not just from the West Bank, but also from the Gaza Strip, and also from within Israel, had a united day of strike. And this moment of unity, uh, which succeeded, struck a lot of fear at the Israelis. The Israeli government's main policy against the Palestinians is divide and conquer. Different groups uh, are set against each other. But, uh, well, the, the Fatah party and the Hamas party just signed a reconciliation agreement in Algeria. Maybe it has no significance because many such agreements have been signed in the past. But nevertheless, this is an important moment for that agreement to be signed because they're sending a message that they're simply not interested right now in factional a bickering among themselves when the real issue is the Palestinian nation's right for self-determination and right to live in freedom and inequality. And under these conditions, uh, the Israelis are facing a very difficult problem. I think one of the main issues that are going to de decide this is the war in Ukraine. Because right now, NATO countries, the West, is very much taking a position of uh, support uh, for Ukraine against the Russian invasion, but the hypocrisy screams to, to heaven because, of course, uh, the Russian occupation of certain parts of Ukraine, which is now ongoing for um, eight months, or set, uh, almost eight months, is, of course, illegal, and it's, of course, morally uh, depraved, but compared to the occupation uh, on, of, of Israeli forces of, uh, of the Palestinian territory, which is ongoing for more than five decades, and the apartheid reality, which is ongoing for more than seven decades, how can you then justify supporting Ukraine and talking about the right of Ukraine to defend themselves when Palestinians don't have the right to defend themselves? And I think, a lot, and I see a lot of Israeli journalists, a lot of Israeli politicians, uh, which are terrified because they realize that as soon as the war in Ukraine will be over, one way or another, the same arguments that have been used uh, to support Ukraine are going to be used to support Palestine, which is one of the reasons that the Israeli government is refusing to support Ukraine as well, because they're, they're trying to take a neutral position. They want this war to go on forever. We are seeing, as you mentioned, Ukraine, uh, the hypocrisy in its full form, whether we look at Iran, where people are standing up how the West is supporting these movements, uh, in my opinion, rightfully so. But nevertheless, we see the hypocrisy when we compare, for example, regions like Saudi Arabia, where the human rights situation is much more worse, and the women situation particularly for women is much more worse uh, as compared to Iran, and of course, uh, the situation in Israel and Palestine. Uh, do you think there will be any change from within um, or do you think external forces like the United States, Germany, the European Union have to play their part within all of this? Well, what do you mean from within? Do you mean from within Israeli society? 
from Israeli or Palestinian society, like Israeli civil society. Uh, we've seen Beth Salem come out with reports of apartheid. Uh, we've seen some positive movements within the Israeli society, but uh, I'm also talking about the Palestinian uh, society. If they can, together with the Israeli civil society, bring about change, or do you think it would require external forces? Well, first of all, the Palestinian society is changing. And there is a lively political debate among Palestinians. Palestinians have a very deep and clear analysis of the political situation simply because they have to, to survive. Uh, but while Israelis, in, uh, as a rule, do not. The Israeli civil society is very weak. And no, I do not expect the Israeli civil society or Israeli politics to change from within, but I do think that it will change. I do think that right, right now it might sound like science fiction, but, in, but very quickly, a vast majority of the Israeli public are going to say, we oppose Israeli apartheid, we are in favor of equal rights of, uh, if, for everyone and the right of return of Palestinians. But they're going to say this after the occupation and the apartheid will fall. This is how it works, and this is how it works everywhere. Uh, also in South, uh, South Africa, only after apartheid collapsed, the white population of South Africa started saying, we were always against apartheid. Of course, and that's how it happens. And yes, I do think that external international pressure is important, but the external international pressure in itself is not what is going to be the game changer or what is going to break, make or break the Israeli policy. What it does, however, is give Palestinians hope that they have options. And if the world abandons Palestinians and says, you are on your own, nobody will help you. This is actually what the Hamas party is saying. We are on our own in the world. Nobody will help us. We have to fight. Uh, and that's our only option. Well, the other factions uh, among Palestinians, uh, and mainly the Palestinian civil society organizations that are now appealing to the International Criminal Court, to civil society organizations around the world, also to the Israeli civil society. You mentioned B'Tselem, absolutely. But, uh, but to everyone who is willing to stand in solidarity to support uh, the BDS movement, boycott, divestment, and sanctions against Israel. And those acts of solidarity give Palestinians hope that they, are, they will be able to achieve freedom and equality by uh, liberal, democratic uh, means which respect human rights and which not use violence. And this is not just because Palestinians really uh, are, are nice people and don't want to use the violence. That's, of course, part of it. But, but the more important issue is that uh, achieving freedom with violence carries a very heavy cost, a very heavy cost. If we look at how Algeria won its freedom from France by using a lot of violence, maybe in retrospect, a lot of people would say this violence was justified against the colonial occupying power. But what happened to Algeria when it became free? It became a very authoritarian, embittered, in unequal country, patriarchal, and uh, uh, has a lot of internal problems, uh, which are still today unsolved. But uh, countries that took the, a, a more peaceful path towards liberation, like South Africa, like India as well, uh, they still have their own problems, of course, but it's a much, much better solution than for Algeria. Shir Heber, independent economist, uh, journalist, and author, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Zeng. And thank you guys for tuning in. If you want to watch part two, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you want us to continue with our independent nonprofit journalism, make sure to donate. I'm your host, Zen Raza. See you guys next time.